So I would say that we can we can start the beginning is only is only really giving you an idea of the different topic that we are going to see today. Now I know that in our time is a little bit short for doing all the job that you know to to explore or uh, the job that need to be done to facilitate a, a, an environment that brings a team of people working together online. But I think is. An hour will be. We will try to make it. Now we might exceed that of uh, five or ten minutes, but we try to stay in an hour. And also make sure, guys, that you ask all the questions that you want anytime. Either use the question and answer. So on the top right, you can you can see that you have chat, you have question and answer. And now I just. It just reminds my I just re reminded to start a poll now because I want to know how many of you are familiar with design thinking, how many of you are not familiar with design thinking. So you should see now a poll in front of you. And you can also choose multiple answers. So it's not only like taking the driving test where you only need to check the answer that is correct, but rather if I want to have an idea, you know, before starting this, how many people are new to design, how many people are already practicing within their organization, and how many people are practicing with their clients. So I'm able to adjust this to your level. So uh, we got about four people that are new completely to design, okay? We have five people that practice design with their clients face-to-face, and only two people that are doing that with their organization remotely and three people that are doing that with their clients remotely. That, that will be kind of the most advanced stages, I, I suppose. Now, we have seven people that practice design thinking with their client. So obviously, those people are familiar with the process of design. So because we are pretty much spread among the... The, the the different you know um, categories. Let's say that we are taking the time to introduce. I, I want to guys to give you a little bit about the context and, and why I'm running this um, uh, this online webinar. Second, I want to give you an overview of the design thinking process that is my way to say it. There are many ways to think about design thinking, how it happens within organization, and how we can lay out the project, the, the, the process. I distill that down in four uh, steps. And I share very briefly uh, uh, the four step and the set of tools that I use. So at least you are able to see where I place, for example, where does the customer journey marketing fit the design thinking process, just to create a common mind. And for those of you that are not familiar with design thinking, I think it will be a good opportunity to have a broad, broad idea on what, or what the design thinking is. Then obviously we are going to explore some of the online thinking tools that we can, uh, um, we can use online. And I want to close the webinar with giving you some uh, tips and mostly what I want to do there, I really want to share my the mistake <laughs> that I did in running this kind of online event with people that maybe were familiar with my work, but most of the people weren't really familiar with my work. So um, let's let's get started. Now, if you want to use either the chat or the question and answer slot to answer your, your question, you can... Um, are the box now there is a I didn't see that actually the chat was are the boxes locked? Let me see. Question and answer. Uh polls. No, you should be able if you refer ah no, the boxes in the mural. Uh, well, yes, yes, they are for for the simple reason that, and that is one of one of the my mistake. So uh, that we don't mess with it. exactly that I don't, I don't know exactly how to spell how to pronounce your name, but that was one of the my biggest mistake when I started to the Chris perfect Chris Chris one of the biggest mistake that I did at the beginning when I was starting to run this online session is that I was I was leaving everything unlocked and. After two seconds, the mural was a complete disaster, and people start to leave the 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 the. the, the um, 
how do we edit the entries then? Well, um, uh, uh, Kapil, I will show you that as soon as we, we arrive. At. So basically, you need to uh, just move uh, the sticky notes that you can find on the left side of the mural and drag that into the, the mural itself. But I will show you, I will show you that uh, in, in a moment. So very brief introduction, very brief introduction. Who am I? My name is Stefano, and obviously I'm from Italy, but I live in Ireland for the last 13 years. I'm getting Irish now. And um, um, the reason why I'm not going back to Italy basically is because my job is taking place here. Um, I have a fiance here and she has family here. So it's kind of difficult, maybe in the long term, I might consider to go back home as my work, yes, is based here. And but also I'm moving my, most of my work online. So working remotely is becoming something that I've been fascinating. I've been fascinated into it in long for a long time. But now I think as many companies are start to start to perceive that not is not an option anymore. I mean, you need to be able to work with your team remotely. You need to be able to interact with your, your team members, with your clients even, and try to facilitate that agenda of design that before you were able to do that face-to-face. -face. Now, let me tell you that there were already difficulties to do that when it comes to visualization. And the main problem there is when you work face to face, you need to have a room in the company where you are able to display all your research in the form of poster, personas, customer journey mapping. And what was happening there is that we run the session, we spend a lot of time to come up with all that art. We hang that on the wall. And then what happened is that somebody else booked the room after us and the meeting room was gone and the all those work needed to come down from the walls. And that was really a pity because later on you need to fold it, put it away, and the next meeting doing everything again, just put it on the wall. So I think online and working remotely really brings to the fore a lot of advantages, even if we are now uh, forced to do so, but I would you know, say that there are a lot of advantages. So what I do, I am a design strategist. Now, when I say that, people get very puzzled, say, does this guy do anything actually in his life? <laughs> because the title is very, is very kind of sound, very fancy. But the reality, what I do is I work with large organization and those companies are, and the managers that are working in those companies are very familiar with the concept of strategy in the traditional way. So they look at strategy as a, a, an analytical tool. And they use tools, for example, like the value chain, the company's positioning, the industry analysis. And those tools, by the way, you can find them all on my website. I have created free download and payable download if you want to have a look at what I'm talking about. But basically, those tools enable you to understand how your companies is competing against other competitor in the industry and how to find a part of the industry that is protected from the competitive forces. Now, guys, we have been doing that in strategy for the last 30 years. What is happening now in strategy is that design, lean startup methodology are entering finally, a, and they are getting the recognition that they deserve, even in big company. At the same time, I work with startups, not individually, but I'm just out of a six week long training course for social enterprise and social entrepreneurs and was amazing. And I was introducing them to the tools of design and really design in there became a way that the social entrepreneur can use in order to create a new strategy. And that is design. And what is happening now in the big organization, they start to realize, actually, I can, act I can start to use design to create new strategies, to create new way to compete. And I collaborate with teams within organization. And for me, those are intrapreneur. So are entrepreneurs working within the organization and try to innovate the organization. So design and strategy come together, I think, are two sides of the same of the same coin one is an established 
a strategy and you use conventional tools. And when you need to develop or to update a strategy, you really need tools like design thinking, Lean Startup, that enable you to change the perspective, look at what you are doing from a different perspective. Now, can you just tell me, guys, if it's something that resonates with you? Is, um, is something that makes sense to, you, sense to you the way that I look strategy and design have you ever thought of looking strategy and design in that perspective or is something that you never really thought about and uh, is something that is new for you you can just use the chat if you like to answer that question so that is in a nutshell what i do now moving forward i uh, want to do more uh, Stephen, want to do more? Um, I'll try to understand what that means, Stephen, if you want to articulate more. Uh, okay. Uh, link strategy with the design. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Link strategy and design. But basically, design becomes a new way to really to push that uh, strategy to a, a new level. Now, I, I was thinking when I was putting together this uh, webinar and say, how can I articulate the reason why I'm actually creating this webinar? Wh why am I doing this? Well, because I'm, there is this concept in my mind that is telling me that many of us still, and many organizations, maybe not individual, but organizations still perceiving innovation as something that is the work of the genius. And what, what happened is that the work of the genio is that they do 99% of the job. So we think in that way that in organization, there is this person that is naturally the innovators and comes out with all the different answer to the problems that they are trying to solve or the opportunity. And what happened that the genius that does the 99% of the job and they, the rest of the people in the companies, they do very little. They actually better if they don't even think about what strategy is, they just execute the order that are reigning from the, this genius. And I think we believe, we, we, we believe the strategies really are Right. Yeah, absolutely. Innovation is top and bottom up thinking. But really, if I if I if I can share with you the mindset of many companies that I'm working with, and I know that by experience, I'm working with different teams in different locations. Sometimes culture is a uh, changes this, but there is this tendency to believe that companies there is the big innovators and all the rest are implementers, and that is what I call innovation 1.0. Okay, and I think now it's time to shift from innovation 1.0 to a type of innovation that is 2.0. Say, what, what does it mean? Well, we start to perceive that our job as designers is no longer to be the designer of the final product or service alone. We do 99% of the job, but rather we become the facilitator of the right environment for design to take place in our organization. Okay. Now, you can look that if you are working within an organization, then you think you as creating that environment, allowing your team to achieve that design level within an organization. If you are thinking of using design with your clients, well, even before, you know, saying to your clients what design is, I think they need to experience design. They need to understand there are tools that we can use and that we can do that remotely. So becoming that facil facilitator, switching from the idea of the designer as, I don't know, take for example, I come from Italy. So when you, you speak design to me, I think about Giorgio Armani or Gucci or maybe somebody that uh, Pininfarina, you know, great car design. You know, we need to sh shift away from that understanding of design and really think of design as somebody that does the hard work of prototyping. So rather than thinking a designer with the finished product, think about a designer that start, start with, a, you know, re rough and ready prototype with paper prototype that do all the hard work to get eventually to the finished product that looks fancy. And also, um, as Rice uh, correctly says, innovation needs bottom-up thinking. Yes, the biggest problem that I see in organization is that that is not the thinking of the problem, but rather the bottom-up is not working. 
It's not working because people don't want to do it. It's just is a problem that they don't feel the opportunity to do so. They are not invited to do so. And I think nowadays what uh, we think about designers and strategic designers are people that are creating that environment and actually get other people in the conversation rather to say, oh, I know I, everything. You just implement that. And unfortunately, I think this gap between innovation point one and innovation point two is still, you know, a big uh, obstacle that many companies need to s overcome. And I work with company and some of them say, oh, I don't really think design is worth it. I don't think it's working. It's not the problem that design is working, uh, working or not. It's that in order to, to follow a design thinking process, first of all, you need to set the right environment and that culture will follow. When if you give the opportunity to people to collaborate with you, I think doors will, will open for you. And when I say that, this is kind of, I want to give you, I created this slide to say, in this case, I was working as an online trainer with the RISE program. The, the RISE program is a funded program that I'm just out of six weeks of training with these amazing people. They are social uh, uh, enterprise working in, the, in, in Ireland. And what I did in the first lesson, I did what I did with you guys. I created the mural and I invited them to say, guys, can you share a little bit about your story? And it was amazing how see from education just to be from me to them, they start to be taking part on the session, start to be on the chat, very active. And it's pretty much my understanding of becoming the facilitator of design rather than the design expert. And that is very a very important point that you don't only have to say to them, you are part of this, but they need to act on it. They need to have somewhere where they can make a contribution. And that could be an online forum, if you have it, or if you work in a company, maybe there is a way that you use to exchange idea within an, a, a company. So you need to have a tool that enables them to come up with that, uh, that feel of contribution that they actually can contribute to your project. So that was kind of a mural that we uh, performed together. Now, that kind of was a very brief introduction. I do many more things. I have an online school where I have online courses on design, and, and that is another way to teach, not in, in, in real time, but rather is asynchronous learning. Okay, so now, can I, Take the time, if you guys are okay with it, I don't see any question coming up, to give you a brief kind of understanding or introduction to the four phases of the design thinking process. And the reason why I really decided to get down to the four phases is because by trying to facilitate design thinking meetings with, with different teams, what I realize is that to keep it simple, okay? The simplicity is the ultimate goal of design. If you are if you're not really clear on what you are going to say, you are going to make things so complicated. So please, when you run, when you are going to run your design thinking session, try to communicate design as simple as you can. So the way that I see design, really, if you go to the kernel of design thinking, you have four stages, and it's good to have you know written down, but also an icon that translate that in something that speak to visual people. So it, it, you can see at the top, we have observation, and there is where you observe the customer in the native environment and try to access those unarticulated customer needs that they are not able to tell you. And that is the reason why we seldomly talk to them, we rather observe them. Because uh, you know, observing somebody, you can start to perceive something that the customer, even if you ask to the customer, is not able to tell you about. Second is ideation. And ideation is really the moment in time where you stop observing your customers and you start to brainstorm of different possible solution that can bring you to something that will go and will move into a phase of prototyping and testing that are much more iterative. But that basically observation, ideation, prototyping and testing are the four phases of any design thinking process. 
Now, there is Ruta says, there is a concept called inspiration as pre-step for ideation. I wonder how do you combine it with observation of customer needs? Now, that is a very good point because I am going to share with you a slide where I do the pre-step of the design thinking process, okay? So I think inspiration is, uh, is not, I don't call that inspiration, but you will see, Ruta, that is very close to, to that part. But one thing, so I'll be back to you, Ruta, in just a few slides. What I want to say to you now is when you say that to the customer, say, guys, the design thinking process, there are four phases, keep it simple. What is really important that you, you clarify the first session is that design is kind of divided in two parts. If you take observation and ideation are really the part that relates to creativity, okay? So when we talk about creativity, we are in a mode of thinking that is divergent. What does it mean? It, it, basically, it means in few single words that you suspend judgment. The reason why brainstorming most of the time doesn't work is that you have your one of the team member that is very creative is always diverging. So coming up with many different ideas and you have an analytical guy that shoot down every single idea. So please make sure because this is the reason, uh, a very important reason why many mostly online, but also face to face a uh, design thinking session don't work. You need to make sure as a facilitator to clarify if that session you are facilitating a creative session or an innovation session. Innovation happens after you, in a way, come up with a new concept, with a new product, with a new idea, then you go into prototyping and testing, and there you need to converge your thinking. You need to have in there all those David's advo advocates that shoot down every single possible of your ideas and say, actually, well, there is an obstacle in there. And it's better to be aware of those obstacles before spending a fortune. OK, so we only invest based on the interaction between prototyping and testing. Now, I can spend the full hours talking about, you know, starting from a paper prototype, going to another prototype that I love. It is called the Wizard of Oz. So imagine you are designing a new app and uh, you create a paper, paper prototype where you fake all the different screenshots. And when the user is you're testing, you know, the viability of that design, there is somebody behind the table that is moving, you know, the, the, the new screenshot based on the choices that the user is making. So design is amazing because really we can fake not only physical product, we can fake, a, you know, intangible product like an app, but also we can fake experiences. So in the course that I just finished to facilitate, there were people that were implementing, you can imagine, social enterprise. There were uh, participants that were saying, um, uh, what is, how can I actually test a service? In fact, there is a part of design that is called service, de service design. It's not something that you can touch. But what is really interesting uh, is how you can use storyboard to articulate a possible service down the road and invite the, your users in co-creating that story with you. Okay, so there is Michael that is asking, where does the problem definition comes in? Well, the problem definition, I'll show you in a second, is coming in what Ruta was asking, what I call the pre-step of design thinking process. Now, to be honest, let me uh, let me share all my mistakes that I did in the last, let's say, five years as design strategist. At the beginning, I was going with a client, or I also work as a trainer, so many times I just train teams. I, work, I was saying, guys, design really starts with observation. Okay, so later on, I realized what Ruta said. Say, but there is kind of, a, a pre-step, a, a, a warming up phase. And I realized that that is absolutely essential. And I want to share that with you because I made that mistake at least 10 times before realizing that people are not familiar with design, that we need to take the time to step back for a second and creating, you remember that kind of environment where people feel welcome, 
to share that idea, that, uh, that understanding. And what, how are we doing that? So basically in, in there, there is, um, I developed different templates, but you can find those templates all over the internet. And one is called the design opportunity template. So basically what you do, you get your team together and, and basically you start to ask, is the opportunity or the challenge? I always like to frame a, a design as so, and creating opportunity but rather than solving a problem, but really design does both. What we have to do at the beginning, we need to agree if, first of all, design thinking is the right tools, the right tool for the problem or challenge that we want to solve, okay? Then you need to align the minds of people on your team that you are on the same page. Why I'm saying that? When a company calls me and says, Stefano, can you run a design thinking session with the team? What happened that everyone in the team has a different understanding of what the problem is. Yes, uh, Prati, I will record this webinar, so I'll make available for you. So what I'm trying to say is essential that you start any design thinking process by aligning your team on try to understand, should we use design or should we use conventional problem solving methods or methodologies, okay? Design thinking is particularly useful in those projects where the team doesn't even know or agree of what the problem is. We call them wicked problems. Are problems that are complex. We need to break them down in soup problems. And in order to understand those soup problems, we need to observe the customer. We need to achieve that understanding of the user that goes beyond data, okay? So that is kind of creating a common mind. Then we use another template to scope the, the project itself. Now, and I can give you an example of the course that I just finished. Talking with social entrepreneurs, I want to solve um, anger in the third world. You know, I want to solve the problem with water in the third world. Now, those are kind of problems that are, go be, are going beyond the scope of any design thinking process of any startup. OK, you might want to reach that point, but scoping and keeping the project that is feasible by the resources that you have, the people that you avail in your team is very important. And I see many design thinking process not reaching even the point of ideation because they scope their project too big and they get overwhelmed with all the different uh, opportunities that they have. So my 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 second tip is just be very clear on the scope of the impact that you want to achieve and the last step in the pre steps for the design thinking process this warming up is really coming up with a design brief now if you take conventional designers so for example you are taking architects or you are taking um, designer of clothes they have they come up with a design brief so they write on a piece of paper, what is our understanding of the project today that we have? Obviously, that is a working pro in progress document. It's not something that when you finish your design thinking process is going to be as when you started, but you need to have a starting point. You need to have a point of reference become your North Star for the project. When and you will see that that will happen many times. There will be people arguing about things. We can go back and we have a document that articulates exactly what is the project and our understanding. And then if there is the need to change it, we can change it. But at least we have a point of reference and that, guys, is very needed. Now, another thing before moving into the design thinking process is that you need to be very clear on the plans. And there are three types of plans that I've learned that are very essential. One is the project setting plans. So, for example, are you working face to face? So you have a, a room where you meet with your customers or with your team and run design thinking from there. Are you working remotely? So that is a completely different scenario. You, you use different tools or you are working in a hybrid way. So it's a little bit remote and a, a bit bit face to face. You need to be very clear on that because that has a lot of implication. Second, another thing that is very important is who is the team that you are going to uh, collaborate with? And I call them allies because there are two teams that you need to have in any design thinking process. One is the core team or the internal team. 
are the people that are part of the project 100%, are involved in the process, in, in, in the project, and they are responsible for it. Now, there is another team that I call the expanded or extended team that are a team of people that you don't need on the project full time, but you need to harness their intelligence in order to refine your design thinking process. And we will see that in the next step. And, and you need to be very clear when you start who is in your core team and who are other people that you know you need within your project but are not needed full time. Could be a colleague that is not in your team, but has a lot of uh, knowledge that you might need for um, the success of your design thinking process. And the last part is research. Research is an essential component in any design thinking process. And one thing that I observe time and over time, there is no clear clarity at the beginning of who is going to be responsible for conducting those research. And if there is one thing in design that people don't want to do is the research bit, okay? So I think it is very clear here that we need to be able to not only to create a, a shared sense of responsibility and a shared sense of where we stand when we start design, but really we need to, to really to be able to say, you are accountable for that part of the design thinking process, research. You are going to interview five people by next week. Okay, so that part of accountability makes us understand that design is not only for, oh, when, when you speak with people, business people about design, oh, artists, they don't get anything done. Well, no, actually design, when enters to be part of a new strategy, need to be focused, there need to be deadlines and need to be responsibility. That is my understanding, at least, that I saw really design creating new strategies because there was accountability in the picture. Okay. So there are a few chat here. There is a router. Uh, I'm still trying to make sense of what is and, and when is what. I'm interested in mapping an entire creative process from cows to value. Okay, so Ruta, because that is kind of a very <clears throat> substantial question. I think what we can do in there, if you like, you I can I can send you a copy of my online thinking mm, design thinking course and maybe if you want also to to write me an email about that because i think in that is kind of a very large question that it relates more to the design thinking process rather than using remote tools so if you want to write me and, and possibly what i do ruta i i will use that question to set up another webinar next week maybe on on maybe looking more at the different part when you go into synthesis or when are we going to use more uh, broad ways to think about what we are doing. Um, I think that is kind of very substantial question that we need another webinar too. Now, Jen is says, um, no, 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 I just, I just need to keep things on track. This, like today's webinar is more about, I want to give you an understanding of the process of design. So I want to show you also the tools. But I want to create more webinars, so I will use that maybe as a starting point for an next session. So Jen says, interesting, I haven't heard, uh, I haven't heard that approach before. I, I imagine inspiration for the ideation piece. How does inspiration feed into the problem definition? Doesn't a surprising insight into the user a met need often appear after observation and isn't the surprising insight part of the problem challenge definition okay so michael you 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 are right and is jan is right what i'm trying to say here is that obviously this shift in perception will happen when you look uh, at your user and you start to look at the way that the user is using an object or what are the pain points in the experience of that user. And then given that information, you start a brainstorming that is not out of the blue, but is based on those observations. And then is when actually creativity kicks in, okay? Obviously, what happens, and, and that I can tell you by experience, mostly working with entrepreneurs, they think they know that part already. And that was actually a good point. You start to 
perceive that your understanding of the problem is actually different because you took the time to stick and look at your uh, and observe or sometimes you have to interview your user and you start to understand oh actually now i can see things that i wasn't able to see in in the past because you step back from your understanding of the problem and you look at the customer but moving forward because the time here is against us is what what is the observation phase well in the observation phase what we do we conduct what, what is called ethnographic interviews and say what the heck are ethnographic interviews well ethnographic interviews are interviews that are conducted in the native environment where the user is when we want to improve their experiences basically and what we do as a, a, a ethnographers we are really digging into their experiences and trying to understand what is a need that the customer has but is not able to unarticulate to articulate that and we call them uh, uh, unarticulated customer needs and what we do though an important part that many people miss if you just perform your interviews and the only one on earth that knows that I conduct those interviews is you, that they don't really help. What we need to do here is to translate those interviews into visuals that bring both our, remember, the core team and the extended team into the game. It means that I don't write a 25, 25 pages long report for each interview, but I make visual. So when we move into the ideation phase, I can create what I call the art galleries. What, what is an art gallery? Well, what we do, we create all this poster of the customer journey mapping, the customer personas, and the poster, we put that on the wall, we invite visitors, most of the time are people, stakeholders, that are not in the core team, but people that are really a stake into the project that we are making, can be the final user, can be somebody with a lot of experience in that area. Then we give them an intro and we become the facilitator of design. Say, guys, this is kind of the, re the result of my researches. What do you see in there that I'm not able to see? And what you are doing there is a pivotal point. You are embracing the collective intelligence of an extended team. And later on, you bring that within your project of design thinking. So that is the starting point of a co-creation session. And being able to facilitate that and try to harness that, uh, what, well, what you're doing there is try to translate observation into insight. And you can get a lot of insight by inviting somebody that knows a lot about that particular topic, but that is not in your core team. After that, given the research and the insight that you have gathered, in your art gallery, you start to brainstorm. What is the difference in there? The brainstorming out of the blue, you can come up with any possible solution and any problems, everything is fine. What we do in, in design when we brainstorm is a data-driven brainstorming. It's based on the data that we have collected and the insight that we have generated. Why session in brainstorming into the design thinking process work? Because people start to have an understanding, and we call that a design criteria, that is really already a common mind. We agree where we stand. And, and, and we take the outcome of our brainstorming session, and we bring that into a phase called concept development and say, what is concept development? Well, the, the simple way to put it is that after you brainstorm, brainstorm really give you pieces of Lego. And then in concept development, you take different pieces of Legos and start to create construction or let's say a building. And every one of those buildings is a possible uh, idea that you put through the prototyping and testing phase. That is kind of a very short <laughs> you know, uh, description of how we can use uh, design thinking to move away, to step away from our understanding of design as it is, and start to get people that could be the final user involved in our research. And then get an extended team of people that are uh, very knowledgeable in that particular area and say, guys, what do you think about it? 
how can you help us in refining our understanding of the problem? And that goes back to the, the question that Jen and Michael ask. Obviously, at the beginning, the only thing that we have is assumption. And obviously, what how we see the world is influenced by our experiences. And what design does very well is stepping out of that. And then you need to be confident to go out to perform those research, to invite those user and the extended team to inform your thinking. Now, successfully, how many successful projects I've seen of people doing this? Well, I think we are still very poor in many organizations doing this because performing those research really takes you a while before you are able to step back from being an interviewer and let the interview being led by the interviewees. That it takes a bit of time to, to learn that skill. On the other hand, I've seen many people that were very uncomfortable to perform those uh, ethnographic interviews that they were able to, um, are able to perform those interviews, let's say less in, in, in less than a month, they turn from very uncomfortable ethnographers to become decent ethnographers. They start to understand, okay, I need to be there and prepare with my, with my microphone. I need to record those interviews because it's when you listen again, those interviews that you get the insight is never, is never at, at, at the moment in time where you are performing them or seldomly. Now, what happened after we have shifted our perception? So the creativity part of the design thinking is over. What happened? Well, you move into prototyping and testing. And guess what? Prototyping and testing is really a way to make your journey of designer or your innovation process at less risky as possible. Okay, And that is very important because what we want in design is really making innovation a, a continuous a continuum a process rather than to be, oh, I want to be innovative today and all of a sudden I prototype and test. Prototyping and test basically tells you that even if you went through all the creative process, you need to finally create this artifact or uh, uh, yeah, an artifact that enable your user. So when I say your user, is somebody that, that just use it to be willing to be a customer. What does it mean? That they need to be willing to pay for it. And let me tell you that people are only willing to pay for your product when they see huge value into it, okay? And the only way that you can create that, that, that value is by making sure that every investment that you put into your product or service is based on a positive feedback that you receive, receive from your user. Okay, and this I think is very um, is very easy to understand, but many times what happened through the design process, we get kind of in love with our idea of our product, and what happened is that we really need to listen to our customers, and every time that the user comes back with a feedback, we need to be able to dig deeper and say, why do you say so? How do you use it? So an example of prototyping and testing is many times you come out with the idea of a product and later on, you don't know if that product really is going to be used by the, 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 the final user and you hand that prototype for your product to your user and it might come out that the final user is using that in a completely different way that you have seen. That will save you a lot of investments, give you a lot of intelligence that you don't have day one. So please use prototyping and testing. So finally, after having run through the design thinking process, let me share you with some online tools that we can use in order to facilitate remote design thinking session. Okay, so what are the tools that I personally use and what is my tip for you guys? Well, there are two tips that I want to give you. First of all, if you remember, we have seen how design is split in two different parts. There is the creative part and the innovation part. You need two tools because they serve two different, um, to, to ser they serve two different use. When we use creative, when we run a creative session, we use program like Mural or another program is called Miro. 
Okay, those are the two familiar two programs that I'm familiar with, and I particularly use Mural because it is the one that allowed up to uh, us uh, allowed you up to now to invite anonymous guests. So you can imagine I work with a lot of teams. I train a lot of people. If everyone that collaborates with me, I need to pay a, a spot for that person, I will be broke. So what happened is that a mural enables you, like I did in this webinar, I, creating a, I created a mural and I share that with participants that are not registered with mural, don't need to create an account, and they can start work straight away. And the one that uh, I created for you guys, I shared the link above, enables you to introduce yourself. So what is your name? What is, uh, you know, your favorite food? That could be a very intro, a, a very appropriate for an intro session of what design is and what the tools. And the, the way that a mural look like is pretty much like this. This is kind of one of the mural that I use at the beginning of any design thinking process. And you can see that I place a name, three step to the design thinking process. Here I map the participants, and then here I created a, a template on the on the top side. If you move horizontally on the right hand side, you can see there is a template. And I invite every team member to write their name and to start to add post it into the different part of the template. That is kind of the first phase. The second phase, what we do is start to add different post-it based on the different ideas that we develop for that part of the template, okay? And the last part, there are, so there are three steps in, the, in this mural. What we do, we start to look, is there, can we cluster those uh, ideas that we got? Why are we doing this? Is just because we need visual help? The reality, the reason why I'm doing this is to create, you remember, a common mind around the design thinking process. When you get your design team aligned early on in the design thinking process, later on, they have that momentum to stick together and to work together. And we do that by giving the opportunity to everyone individually to share his or her own idea, and then to see if somebody else in the team had a similar idea and try to see if the combination of the two ideas generate actually a good or a better understanding of the problem that we are trying to solve with design. Now, obviously, this part is creative. It's when different people come together with different ideas. So we need a tool like this. So please have a look. I just typed down for those of you that are not familiar with it. Is, uh, one is mural. Um, dot co and the other one i think is miro.com but i'm not completely sure I, it should be miro.com but that are the two kind of mm, uh, software that i would suggest what happened that miro catch up with anonymous users do you remember people that you can invite within a um, you you create the, the in this case the 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 mural Mirror is called different is um, and what you do you send them an anonymous link and they can you know start to participate anonymously up to now was impossible in fact I think still in beta within within their platform so let's say that you have run your brainstorming session come up with a different ideas what do you need to do well hey, now is better that you start to use another online tool that is a Kanban-like project management, and you start to, to write down who is responsible for developing that part of the design thinking process, okay? If you can see here, the, I use the same visual, so I think visualization is an essential part of any design thinking process, but what these tools does is really enabling you to uh, put down a set of tasks and subtasks creating deadlines and who is going to be responsible to, um, to perform that activity, okay? So when we meet next week, we know that I'm responsible for that part of the design thinking process, or you know, my colleague is responsible for performing an interview, and only when that is done, then I can proceed in another step of the design thinking process. So even if you're working in internal team or with your customers, 
please use both tools. Both tools are absolutely essential for the success. At the beginning, I, will, I was only use the creative part, only mural or Miro um, board. And I realized that if you are not placing down deadline or if people are not accountable for their work, well, then design goes belly up because there is no traction. So this project management really uh, keep you into the, uh, the, the conversation. Now, the last part that I want to share with you guys, what are then, what, what can, can we take away from this session? What, what do we need to do if we are um, going to run this online thinking session? Uh, only, only, okay, first, I would say that First of all, you need to do the work. So if you remember, for those of you that have seen my mural, and we are going to see that in a second, I needed to block some field into the mural. Otherwise, what was happening in there, that if you invite somebody that is not familiar using the mural, they can move boxes, and then all the mural goes, you know, goes really is out of, is not workable because all the parts are moved. So you need to familiarize yourself. Uh, project management, okay, sorry, Jen, the project management tools, there are many that you can use. So for example, the, the most famous is called Trello, I would say. Now guys, if you would like to suggest uh, uh, suggest other tools, you can suggest, okay, so right, uh, there is Asana. And now I won't just, I will share mine in, in a few seconds. Um, I was able actually to use my own domain in mine, and that is a software called Pluto. It's a, an English startup, and they're doing a very good job. Um, so first of all, you need to set up the right environment for that, um, th that session to run well is, I would say, 90% of the success of any online session is determined by your understanding of the tools that you're going to use and how much you have made the pre-work on that particular board that you are going to use. Many people just said, oh, it's my team. I don't need really to get ready. No, you absolutely need to get ready when you work online. The second step that I would suggest to every one of you is to connect and communicate with your team. W what does this mean? Can you break it down? Well, you need to create that online space where people can connect and share before the session. And it's pretty much what I did with you in a very you know, superficial level. I send out an email and say, guys, this is the mural that we're going to use during the session. Can you just do some homework before coming to the session? What is happening? The happening is that the session is not going to last 10 hours. It's going to you last 45 minutes because all the work has been done at home. And when we get together, we really get our ideas on paper and we start to work on it, okay? And that is absolutely essential. The third step, obviously there, there is a session and there is, let's say an hour long session, an hour, one hour and a half long session. And what you need to do, you need to be the facilitator and not the broadcaster. What does it mean? That in, during the time, you need to give the space to everyone in the team or your clients to be listened, to be heard. What happened is that most of the time you have somebody that is very talkative and uh, is kind of overwhelming everybody else. A uh, facilitator is independent. It keeps the distance from any particular idea and rather becomes the person that is the conduit for the conversation rather than to be the conversation itself. So you need, and that is a skill. That is a skill that requires a good bit of meeting before you, because it's easy to get involved. Oh, no, no, we need to do that. You need to, do, I think we need to step out for a second from our shoes as the Steve Jobs that knows everything, but rather to say, okay, we are all learning and this environment enables you, everyone, to take a sticky notes and to put it wherever they want or to vote even that particular idea. And the last step that I want to share with you is essential that after the online thinking session, you follow up, okay? You end the session by setting tasks, do you remember in project management? So the outcome of an online session is something that you have developed visually in Mural, Miro, or any other visual uh, tool. And then before the end of the session, we need to make sure that everybody is very clear on the deadlines, on the responsibility 
to move on and to have done before the uh, before the next meeting okay and and also by the next meeting you need to be very clear on what are your expected outcomes not your yours but rather the team what would we think we have achieved by a week time okay that kind of were the kind of the four steps that I would say any remote uh, design thinking facilitator really need to consider. Not only superficially, but really what does it mean for me to get ready for the session, to communicate with my uh, team or my clients? What does it mean to become the facilitator, to be the one that is impartial, that is able to make people that are more shy to be part of the conversation and then uh, follow up? So what should I do once the meeting is over? Should I send out a reminder? Should I invite people to actually to be uh, aware that they have deadlines? Now we have Ruta, soft skill for remote facilitating is hard, absolutely. How to blend silence with talking, encourage that everyone speaks, etc. Now Ruta, I have to say that that is completely right. My experience, if you, and let me start to share the screen here, just very quickly, I want to share my screen to give you an idea of um, here. Yeah, okay, this was a, the mural. It should load in a second here. Okay, so this was the mural that I set f up for you guys, okay? What happened, Benjamin, Tanya, and Jen, very creative people here, and Chris, why they start to be part of the conversation? Because I put in there an invitation for them to participate. I think the problem with people not talking is because they weren't felt like a, invited to the conversation. And I think the tools that we avail today make them more comfortable to share their ideas to come up with things that are not necessarily, uh, they wouldn't have shared unless you create that space. Do you remember, possibly what is emerging from this session is that you need to create that online space. And I think tools like Mural and Miro really give you the possibility to, to create that safe learning environment that get people into the conversation. Now, as you see, when I was talking about Preparation. You see, there is the anonymous shark here. There is somebody in in uh, in the in, in the webinar with with us today. All you see, all these blocks are locked, so people are not able to move this part of the mural. What they only part, the only part that they are able to move is the part that they have, you know, introduced themselves. So that is part of that preparation that need to be done. And uh, you can create any type of mural. Uh, this is kind of just a mural that I use in order to get uh, people that don't know each other to familiarize with one another. And let me show you quickly the other tool. This is kind of the other tool that I use is, is a project management system where you have all the project where you are working. So let me show you very briefly the design thinking process. So this is kind of a mural where I put down all the steps of a design thinking process are not, honestly, are not all here. Ah, Stephen, it was you. <laughs> it's cool. And, and, and what happens in there is that let's say that we are talking about is the design thinking a, a process appropriate for my idea so in there in there you can open it and you can start to see that you can create custom fill you can delegate in this case i have delegated to my alter ego stay and it's just a, a private now you can see very important that you can start to attach files and you can start also to have a, Comments. So let's say that um, I say you can say I don't think uh, think this is feasible. But you understand that later on you post and the other participants start to have um, a start to have kind of I think I misspell everything, but that is fine. <laughs> but people start to have input from you when you are working on the platform and they are not on the platform with you. So 
the design thinking process with these tools is not only happening when you are in the same room with them, but rather imagine your clients, you create as in a line space for them where they can constantly be working on asynchronously on the same project. So let's say that you give them a deadline for one week to, in one week time to perform that step of the design thinking process. What you can do because you are kind of in the, the master of this design thinking process, a project management platform, you can go in and see the process that they made during that week. You can see if they are stuck a, a, into a, a specific part of the design thinking process. So I just wanted to take the time to show you these two tools because I think the project management and the kind of the more creative uh, platform as Mural really can uh, enable you to bring design thinking remotely within your organization, but also with your uh, really with your customers. Now, what I want to do now, um, oh, the slides are back here. Uh, I want to see if there is any uh, any question and um, if there is any other um, issue in there. But we reached the three o'clock. I think was uh, it was kind of um, a, just a beginning of this conversation. Hopefully, we will have more webinars, and I will keep you on the loop. And um, a topic for another webinar: How do you? do things like customer interviews, observation and customer. Okay, Jan, that is opening a huge topic into the design thinking process. Maybe we will run in the future different webinars uh, where we can talk of a specific part of the design thinking process. Today has been a little bit rush because possibly I wanted to show you the design thinking process and placing on top of it the design thinking remote tools. But I think has been kind of interactive and we had different questions. So guys, if you have any questions, you can um, contact me or if you have suggestion that you want to, um, to explore, you can contact me. Uh, my website is stefanomessori.com. You can find my learning platform at content.stefanomessori.com. My email, I think you got also through the, to the webinar email and uh, you can have a conversation with me at book.stefanomessori.com. Okay, guys, listen, have a lovely uh, evening, afternoon, or morning, depending where you're based in the world. It's been a pleasure, and I'll see you next time. Stay safe.